Let me introduce Lisa Strawacker and Serena Fukushima. They are the public outreach and education team um, for the Maui Invasive Species Committee. And today they're going to be sharing with us MIS 101, an overview of invasive species management in Maui Nui. So take it away, ladies. All right. Aloha mai kako, mahala nui everybody for joining us today. Um, like Beth said, my name is Serena Fukushima. I'm here with Lissa Strohecker. Um, like she said, we are the public relations and education team for Maui Invasive Species Committee. Um, here today to do an overview of MISC 101, um, Invasive Species Management in Maui Nui. This is our first presentation to kick off our uh, Maui Nui mini series that's happening all week. So if you are following along with our social media um, or on our mailing list, you'll see that we have about nine more presentations to go for this week that are all about what's happening here in Maui Nui. So we're gonna just give a brief overview right now, um, but stay tuned for some more um, information and specific details on the different species we um, target and the crews that we work with. So before I talk about invasive species management um, and what we do, we just want to give a baseline of a general overview of, you know, what invasive species are, um, why they're important, why they're detrimental, um, and where that foundation is. So um, Hawaii, we are the most isolated landmass on Earth. Um, we're in the middle of the biggest ocean um, farthest away from any other land masses, and that makes us extremely special. Uh, we're the endemic species capital of the world. So we have over 10,000 species of plants and animals that are found nowhere else on earth, which makes us extremely unique. Um, unfortunately, this also makes us an endangered species capital of the world. Um, of the 1,225 endangered species of animals and plants that are listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 481 and counting are from Hawaii. So it's an unfortunate statistic. This also makes us an invasive species capital of the world, where the number one um, invasive species are the number one threat to the survival of our native plants and animals. So what is an invasive species? What are these guys? They are an alien species whose introduction um, does or is likely or currently causes economic or environmental harm and threatens human health. Um, it could be one of these things or it could be all of these things that this species does. Um, and, not, and also good to note that not all alien species are invasive. So we do have some that come over here that don't cause um, harm or detriment to our environment or our people. So just some terminology, kind of MISC 101 for you. Um, what is a native species? That's a plant or animal that arrived without the help of humans. Um, you might be familiar with the three W's of how it got here, um, wings, water, waves. I like to flip that and make it into the three M's of Makani, Moana, Manu. So these um, species, they didn't you know, catch a flight on Hawaiian Airlines or jump onto a cruise ship. They got here in one of these possible ways. Um, when they got here, they evolved into these unique endemic species that we see here today. So on the flip side of native species, we have our non-native and introduced species. These arrived with people either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and again, like I said, not all introduced species are invasive. So kind of starting on the extreme, we have this mongoose over here showing off his teeth that was intentionally introduced by humans. I think we all know that story. Um, and it is an invasive species. Our plumeria in the middle was introduced. It's not invasive and it only um, proliferates through human propagation. And then we have these buttery avocados on the right. Um, they were introduced by us, but also um, grow in the wild, but don't have invasive threats or qualities to them. And they're more naturalized in the environment. Our invasive species like this screen, they crowd out our environment, they crowd out native species, um, and they have that tendency of taking over um, and causing some significant damage and harm. So this is just a handful of some of the invasive species that are threatening Hawaii right now. Unfortunately, there's a whole lot more um, than what's on this slide. So why should we worry about invasive species? Why do we care about them? What harm do they cause to our environment? Um, why do we do anything about it? So invasive species, they threaten our environmental integrity. 
Um, they're threatened the survival of Hawaii's unique plants and animals. Here's some photos, unfortunately, showing the damage that they do um, and the current impacts that they have. We do have some hope though. So a lot has been lost, but we have hope for our species through the amazing conservation work that's currently happening by many of the agencies that are presenting in HISAM this month. Um, and we have, we have success stories and we have stories of continued hope. Um, another thing that I like to see is like those kupu kupu that are coming out of fresh lava flows. We have this future generation and this next generation that wants to do this type of work. They care about Hawaii, they're passionate about it and they wanna continue. And so we see them emerging to pick up the ball where we, when we throw it to them and continue this type of work and making sure our plants and animals are protected. So invasive species, what else do they threaten? They threaten our environmental integrity and our watershed function. So remember that other side we looked at as the most isolated landmass in the world, surrounded by this big salty ocean. Freshwater is pretty important. And our native forest acts in an amazing way um, to capture water and to bring it into our watershed that will then go down eventually into our faucets and our homes. Um, we need our native forests for this. Um, Hawaii forests are some of the most unique and precious in the world, and they act like a sponge to trap this water and this moisture and percolate down into our watershed. Uh, without this system, um, we're in dire, we're in dire straits, um, and our, our entire being of living here is threatened because without water, we have no life. Invasive species also pose a, th uh, pose a threat to our culture. Um, the loss of native species disrupts our Hawaiian cultural practices, our Aina-based connection to native resources, and so much more. Um, native species and culture throughout the world um, work hand in hand, and especially here in Hawaii. And we've seen some of the impacts that happen to Hawaiian culture when we lose species. Um, and so we want to continue to protect our native plants and animals in harmony with Hawaiian culture as well. Invasive species threaten our ag productivity and sustainability. They cost farmers, ranchers, consumers millions of dollars every year. Um, whether it be our pasture land and ranch land being disrupted by fireweed or two-line spittle bug to different economic industries such as the papaya and banana industry um, threatened by different invasive species like banana bunchy top um, and so many more examples. But um, invasive species pose a threat and continue to pose a threat to our food sustainability and sovereignty. And lastly, invasive species pose a threat to our quality of life. They threaten our security, our comfort, our cultural practices, how we work, how we live, how we play. We already see some of these impacts happening in our islands. Um, we have this great cartoon by our LFA coordinator, Brooke, about just, you know, what happens if there's little fire ants on the beach. You're getting stung. You can't enjoy that place as much. Um, Koki frogs as well. We lose lots of sleep um, and making impacts into our community. Um, and so we see what can happen um, and what we want to prevent from happening. So why are there so many invasive species in Hawaii? We looked at a rate of species introduction. So at one point there was maybe one new species coming to Hawaii over a 70 million year period. Um, that was when those species were coming and then evolving into our endemic species. Fast forward to modern day with all of our ships and planes and travel, uh, we have one new species arriving in Hawaii just about every three days. Um, if that species, it's not necessarily invasive, but it does have that potential and that threat to become invasive. This affects the characteristics of our native species. They have no predatory defense because when, because of their evolution, they drop these defenses, they had no predators. And so they're not ready to handle this influx of threats that are happening. Um, and our invasive species, they are out of control essentially in Hawaii. There's nobody to check them. So they're coming from their native home where maybe they had um, predators like snakes controlling them, but come to Hawaii and they don't have that predator anymore. So it's a, it's a big party and they can just continue to grow unchecked. Um, and that is a huge detriment to our native species and our way of life. So I'm gonna toss the ball over to Lissa to continue the rest of this presentation and mahalo.
I'm glad my mic was on this whole time. Awesome. <laughs> there we go. Let me get mine going on. Get this shared. Okay. Um, oops, here we go. Okay, so um, invasive species prevention in Maui. Um, it's a very collaborative. So invasive species management happens on multiple ends. Everybody to some degree um, deals with invasive species. If you mow your grass, you're dealing with invasive species because the grass that makes up most of our yards is actually invasive to a certain degree. Um, so we all deal with it, but we deal with it at different levels. Um, there's the prevention side where the Hawaii Department of Agriculture is keeping a lot of these pest species out. Um, they do amazing work. Every day they save, save us. Um, and then on the other end, there's uh, area led management. So like what the national parks is doing or the watershed partnerships where they have a boundary and they're addressing species within that boundary. Um, in the middle to a certain degree are, are the invasive species committees of Hawaii of which MISC is one of them. Um, there's five invasive species committees throughout the, the state and they exist and work together um, to fill the gaps. They work across traditional boundaries. So regardless of where that plant invasive plant or animal is found, um, we work to address them. They're informal voluntary partnerships. They're actually um, a project of the University of Hawaii, the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit. Um, and we depend on our committee, which is made up of resource managers, um, people from different, sta different stakeholders. So agriculture, um, farming, natural resources, et cetera, that come in and they help us, um, help guide us and select our target species for us to work on. Um, and there's a, a time period in which these things can effectively be stopped. So again, if we're working within, you know, we're species led in our approach, we're working no matter where that plant or animal is found, um, there is a time in which we can effectively address it. Um, this is an example of a species area curve or an invasion curve. Um, this is, of course, area on the, the X, the, this axis, and then over time. Um, the, of course, the, the, you know, the best time is to get the species before it becomes introduced. So preventing these things um, is, of course, much more effective than trying to deal with them when they're at this phase. Um, there's a lag phase. So this is ideally when these species are found and that's what we're, we're working towards. So we have a team of early detection specialists, Forrest and Kim Starr, that go around looking. Um, periodically, they'll do roadside surveys looking for these things. Um, most of our control activity that we're working on is in this area. So little fire ants, they are present and we are hoping to get them um, to the eradication phase. Um, same thing, you know, pampas grass, for example, is another example. Um, as these species have been here longer, their cost to control um, gets higher. So in theory, if you had enough money, you could get rid of anything, um, but that's not quite the, the case. So we're trying to work within our budgets. And so this shifts a little bit. So Koki frogs, public awareness is, you know, in Haiku, it's up here, but throughout Maui County, you may not be quite as aware of the presence of Koki frogs. Um, and then once the species is really widespread and distributed throughout, um, an area, then it's up to sort of local control. So controlling that invasive species within a boundary. So um, something like uh, termites, I mean, you're controlling that within the boundary of your house, for example, but we're not gonna be able to eradicate termites. So it's up in this local control. Um, up here is when you introduce a natural enemy. So something like um, Serena was talking about where it's a predator that can, can reduce the impacts of that species. So again, um, when we're trying to detect our invasive species or when we're trying to decide what we're going to work on, we're looking at this species area curve. Uh, here's an example. Um, there's a lot of invasive species coming in. So, you know, you can imagine with a new species every three days, um, there's the potential for us to do a lot of things. So we prioritize by the threat. Um, it's a combination of threat and then distribution. This is an example of one of our target species. This is a veiled chameleon. Um, veiled chameleons, you'll see they look a little bit different than a Jackson's. They have this shark fin on their head, um, whereas the Jackson's have the horns. Um, both species are invasive, however. Um, but veiled chameleons, um, they have the capacity to live up to a much higher elevation. So they can live up to 9,000 feet, up where it's much cooler. Um, and they get much larger. So they get about two feet long, including their tail. They're also in captivity, they're fed baby mice. And so they are, um, they have a more diverse diet. 
So there was a lot of concern after these were first detected in Maui um, County that they could cause the same impacts as something like the brown tree snake on our native birds. Um, so when they were first detected, it was highly concerning. And so we did surveys to figure out how widespread they were. Turns out it was really just an area in Makawao. So this is Haleakala Highway. This is Makawao Avenue. So they were in a pretty limited area. So a high threat species, not yet widespread. That's something we can take on and target to control. And so we did, and we have not found a bell chameleon since 2008. Um, they are, however, um, illegal to possess. So if you see one, um, please turn it in through the Hawaii Department of Agriculture's amnesty program or report it to us. Um, so these are some of the species that we've, of course, um, our target species for the Maui Invasive Species Committee. Um, this is only some of them. Uh, we have a list of about 40 different plants and animals that we work on, but these are the ones that take the bulk of our time and resources. Um, ivy gourd, koki frogs, myconia, little fire ants, campus grass, fountain grass, um, and then at one point the veiled chameleon. Um, this is an example, again, being species led in our approach to management, it means we work pretty much everywhere. So in Myconia is these purple dots out in um, East Maui. And so you can tell that's a, a pretty, um, we've been effective at containing that to a certain limited area. We have crews that are out hiking day in and day out, they just hike up and down in this section of forest looking for these. And then can, they do a lot of control along the roadway to keep that from spreading. Um, pampas grass, again, wherever it's found. Um, it's a habitat generalist that can be found in Malka, um, Makai. Um, it's found a lot on eroded slopes. Um, and you can kind of see some of our other species, ivy gourd, et cetera, distributed throughout the area. Um, we do a lot of survey work. So again, that early detection, you know, cause you can't, you can't find if you don't look. Um, and so this is a lot of helicopter work that goes on search, seeking out these invasive species. These are flight tracks from 2000 to 2017. And you can see how much it overlaps with the priority watershed areas um, because as Serena was talking about earlier, um, the impacts to the watershed can be pretty significant. Um, then we have our another crew. This is our Koki crew. This is one of our, our largest um, projects right now. Um, and this was in the peak. This was last quarter. We were we had more people on our Koki crew than we've ever had before. And this is not even all of them. And they work um, mainly in the Haiku area, um, but they'll go wherever Koki are found. On, and they build pipeline. They work you know, in gulches, etc. They're out oftentimes at night. Um, this is not a koki frog of note. Um, that is a uh, bufo toad. Um, but, so, but yes, koki frogs are much smaller. They whistle at night, of course, and we'll learn more about them this week through the um, other invasive species presentations by MISC. Um, and so yeah, we, are, so we have a large crew out hiking, installing pipeline. You can see they're building a pipeline in here that they'll then go in at night and spray. Um, it's a dilute solution of citric acid. So that brings up another point is that we are trying to use the latest research methods to make sure our um, control methods are as targeted as possible. Citric acid is an example of a, a, a method that it targets mainly just the koki frog or other soft bodied invertebrates. So worms don't like it, but luckily worms are underground. So the koki frogs it comes in contact with their body and causes them to have go into osmotic shock. Um, and it doesn't seem to have, or it doesn't have impacts on other species um, present. So um, any, if it's got an insect with a hard body, um, it um, rolls right off and then it breaks down really quickly. So it's very dilute, targeted um, and effective at controlling these invasive frogs. Again, the threat of those is significant because they do shift the balance towards other non-native species. Um, because koki frog are so widely distributed, we also work closely with the community. So this is an example. This is our koki community control program where we've worked um, with neighbors and neighborhoods that are in the, along the areas that are affected by koki frogs, um, empowering them to help control. Um, and it's been very effective um, working, you know, we've been doing the program for just under two years um, and working with quite a few neighbors to, to get this done. It's great to see people out. It brings people together too, so they get to meet their neighbors. Um, and koki frogs, so this, while this may be the main distribution is this in this area, this is a map of all the hand captures. Um, so, you know, all the potential places that they've shown up that then we have responded to and gotten rid of them. So without our work, you can imagine there would be populations of koki frogs throughout this area. 
Um, so it is a rapid response, finding these things early. Uh, little fire ants, that's another example of, you know, that's our other third main crew. Um, and so there is a team of uh, three right now that are out doing surveys, looking for these as well as controlling. So um, this is one where we really depend on public reports to find these. Uh, this is an example. Not all of these surveys were done by MISC crew. A lot of these done, um, surveys were done by school kids um, and then the community through different awareness events and activities like you can do during Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Week or month, excuse me. Um, this is one project where it's been pretty innovative of an innovative um, control techniques and you'll learn more about this. Um, you can see in this picture how small the ants are and one of the threats of this species is that they live from the tops of trees all the way to the ground and form these super colonies that then when the wind blows, they'll fall down on people and sting and it can be very painful, very itchy. They also cause major declines in biodiversity, attack native um, species like our you know, rainforest, our birds, um, ground nesting seabirds, etc. So there's one of the largest infestations under control in the state is in Nihiku. And given the distribution and the density of vegetation, on um, we developed and have been working to um, use aerial control to control little fire ants. So you'll learn more about this week, but it's pretty cool. So it's one of the things is that on um, Invasive species management, sometimes if you've got a problem that's you know big enough and you're willing to solve it, it's thinking outside of the box and trying to come up with solutions. Um, and then we have a pretty active um, education program and outreach program. So you know, a lot of times during non-COVID times, you'll find us at a lot of the community events. Um, we go to school groups um, and a host um, school activities um, and try to you know, communicate the issues. So it's pretty huge um, because really what it, what it comes down to is that we can't do this by ourselves. We need help from the community. Um, so for example, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the, the detection efforts for little fire ants and how a lot of that has been from school kids. Um, actually, little fire ant detections, 11 of the 17 um, incidences of little fire ants were reported to us by the community. So it's been extremely helpful. Um, and again, you know, we depend on your reports. Um, online reporting can be done through the 643 PEST website, even if you're not sure um, where to go. Um, check out our website. So that's one of our other outreach tools. Um, they'll see over here on our targets pest species. You can find learn more about these species. Um, we regularly post, we have a presence on social media on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, there's also a specialized website if you're interested more in little fire ants. We do um, annual awareness campaigns throughout the state. Um, and this is a great place to find out recent information, um, tools. Um, there's activities you can do at home in your neighborhood or community, um, more, in, more information about the impacts of these. But this is something that we collaborate on. Um, and it's just paying attention and being more aware of what's going on in your community. Um, and there's all these different, you know, this is yet another tool. This is the Hawaii Plant ID and Insect ID group. These are great resources as well um, for, you know, if you're not sure what something is, they'll help identify it for you. Um, say you think it's a native plant. Um, and these are great tools. Um, but ultimately, the other, you know, in, if you step back a little bit and the big, big picture at the, the issues of invasive species in Hawaii, um, biosecurity is a key issue. So improving the prevention on efforts, uh, keep things from getting here in the, the first place um, is going to be the biggest bang for our buck. It's the most important step in, is to prevent these things from getting here. So. Um, the Hawaii Invasive Species Council has an, a biosecurity plan um, that's developed and is being tracked as it goes through. Um, and you can get up to the up to date. This is you know a year old. Sorry, I should have gotten a new photo for you guys. Um, but you can see where things are at. And the other important tool in invasive species management in Maui Nui is effective biocontrol. So again, um, like Serena said, you know it's not um, the mongoose. The mongoose is of course not effective. Um, it wasn't researched, it was brought in erroneously on, and even at the time, you know, there were people that didn't think it was a good idea, but this was in the 1880s. So hopefully we've learned some stuff on um, the process for bringing biocontrol in and, and using it in Hawaii has changed quite a bit. 
Um, and actually since the 1970s, there have been no non-target impacts. So they uh, um, go into a massive amount of research and testing, both in choosing the biocontrol agent. So for example, this is one of our highly invasive devastating species. This is Myconia. And they're in process of, um, they've gone through the testing and most of the testing um, for this is a golden um, butterfly that the caterpillar stage eats the giant leaves of Myconia. And so um, it will actually, doesn't recognize anything else as food um, other than the Myconia plant. So this is an essential tool for us um, when dealing with these invasive species. Um, it's not something MISC manages, we're still working within our little constraints, but um, it's essential as a tool um, going forward. Um, but we're always facing new challenges. Um, you know, again, the, the inter-island and interstate um, introduction of these species. Um, and then sometimes each um, island has a different set of pest species, so they're moving a lot inter-island. So for example, um, we um, worry about accidentally sending mongoose um, and koki frogs to Lanai'i um, and Kauai. Um, and same thing, we worry about getting um, koki frogs from Big Island or other places. Um, and, you know, long-term funding. Um, Maui Invasive Species Committee were funded um, made primarily through grants from year to year. So especially in the upcoming years, it's a bit of a concern. Um, but that's where you guys come in on expressing your concerns about these issues. Oops. Um, but then successes, we've been able to work, um, we have really good collaborative par partnerships um, from you know, East Maui Watershed Partnerships, DLNR. Uh, we partner oftentimes when we have large projects, um, we'll contribute to each other's efforts um, and leverage what we've got. So we have a pretty good patchwork. It might be um, you know, filling the gap and complementing each other throughout um, the state in addressing these invasive species to keep them from becoming widespread. Okay, um, that's where I'm gonna have Serena come join me back in here. Um, but yeah, you guys are definitely the most important partner in helping us keep Maui no Ka'oi. And if we had, I saw a few questions come up. Do you want me to, you got them, Lisa, or I can read them to you? Um, let me you stop. You have a couple more slides, I think, in, is it in your presentation? Did I, let's see. Advance it. Oh. Maybe not. <laughs> There's some, yeah, there might be some. Let me see if I can uh, stop my screen share. Well, we just had a couple more slides. I can get started as she pulls it up. But um, that was, you know, a lot of work that we're doing primarily in Maui, uh, Maui Island itself. But we do work throughout uh, Maui Nui. So we have the Moloka'i MISC or Mo MISC. They're their own separate committee. Um, that operates under MISC funding. So we have a very strong partnership um, and relationship with them. Um, there's a list of target species that they are tackling over on Moloka'i, um, some including the New Zealand flax, um, Barbados gooseberry, rubber vine right there. And so yeah, that's yeah. some of the work uh, MISC is involved with uh, Moloka'i um, and MOMIS tackles and then um, also, um, well, also on Lanai and um, Koho Olave, there aren't separate MISCs, but we do work in partnership. They are our neighbors, and so we work together with them um, when needed. Um, but there's some great work already being doing, um, being done through Kirk and Prete uh, Koho Olave Ohana on Koho Olave um, that will help to kind of kokua them. Um, also on Lanai, Pulama Lanai, there's some great work being done. Um, as well. And if you stay tuned, Kari Bogner will be speaking later this week about the work that her and her team are doing over on Lanai. So uh, looking forward, we have some great presentations this week coming up. I will repost the links in the chat. Um, and that's the way you can access these webinars. So save that link, um, the first one, the DLNR website, to come back and get into these webinars that we have coming up. Uh, we also have a fun activity for Haisam this month. We have a MISC scavenger hunt. So you can actually take part in some of the activities that we talked about um, and really help us in that mission. 
um, and get hands on with invasive species management. Here on Maui Nui, um, everybody who completes a scavenger hunt will get a prize automatically sent over to them. Um, and then you'll be automatically entered into a raffle to win one of three ohia trees that we have as prizes. So um, definitely a fun thing to participate in. You can check that out more um, on our Facebook and Instagram. Um, and also um, it should be up on that deal on our website as well. But um, mahalo again for your time, everybody. And we will take some questions. Okay, I can, okay. do you want me to read them to you guys? And then sure, I'll let you, that'd be great. you guys are the experts. Um, the first was a comment from JB Friday that um, it's kind of depressing that most of MISC's target species are widespread mm -hmm. on uh, Hawaii Island. But then he followed up with um, wondering what was the highest elevation that you guys have found little fire ants? Um, I believe the highest elevation is it's just right about a thousand feet. That would be um, in Haiku um, area. That's our highest population, actually, because most of the infestations have been found um, low elevation. How about uh, Hawaii Island, though? I mean, I think the potential is that they can get up pretty high. So I think anywhere people are living, there's the potential for them to, to live up to high elevation. And that is unfortunate, JP, but also mahalo to you guys at FISC and with all of your agencies that you're all working together in preventing um, invasive species from getting out of Hawaii Island. And you know, you guys are kind of the, the forefront sometimes. So we thank you for all the work you folks are doing and things like little fire ants and rapid ohia death and queens of longhorn beetle and two-line spittlebug. Um, you guys are doing awesome work. So mahalo for that. We're proud, we're proud to partner with you. Okay, and then there was a question. Um, can a leak be shared for plant and insect ID websites? And for that person commenting, I also, um, if they send, they can send their email privately to just the panelists if they want, but, or do you guys have some good ones that you can share? Um, I would say, yeah, the uh, Flickr, the Flickr group, Hawaii Plant and Insect ID. I can see if I can share that link for you guys. Um, let me close this down here. I'll put that in the chat, um, but there's also Star Environmental just for confirming your identification. That can be very helpful, but if you're totally guessing from the beginning, um, yeah, the Flickr ID. Okay, and I put in that email as well if you wanna email us and we can send that over too. So then there was a question about Albizia and whether it is a problem on Maui and are there resources or processes to manage? That is a good one. Yeah, so that's an example of on, um, it's again a species that is a little bit beyond the capacity of an organization as far as the, the tools and expense too for us to be able to tackle. Um, I know there's collaborative groups um, on Hawaii Island that are working on it. It's definitely an invasive species. Um, and so within neighborhoods, um, I know the Big Island Invasive Species Committee has facilitated control by you know, doing trainings and working with crews and stuff like that, um, neighborhood crews, neighborhood groups to address it. But on Maui, there are no control programs. It's sort of a landowner situation. And there was another one in the chat um, about the king toad that we saw earlier. Is it considered an invasive species? Is it relatively low impact or do people control this, this one, the king toad? Um, again, that's, you know, it's definitely, if you have dogs, you're very concerned about the presence of um, the photos and stuff because they can, they have, they're definitely invasive. Um, but again, it's a widespread species. They've been here for a long time um, and one of the, you know, there's sort of local control techniques. So trying to keep um, populations uh, down around, uh, water populations down. So that will help reduce the presence of cookie frogs. So a lot of it is, you know, it's sort of, we really promote um, integrated pest management. So the combination of um, cultural practices, um, cultural meaning, meaning on reducing the, the habitat like ability, I guess to say. So for example, um, not having standing water reduces the attractiveness of the habitat for um, cane toads. 
Uh, there, there is more. Um, okay. There was a question. Well, and JB Friday gave an update about um, elevation of little fire ants in Big Island. And he commented that in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, they are all the way up to 4,000 4, feet. So um, material that was brought in by a road crew, road repair crew. Um, okay. And I'm sure that's one that was being targeted for um, containment and control over there. I'm guessing, I bet. But there is a question about what is from um, Nurse Wanda. What is the best way to kill Albizia? Ooh, I love all these Albizia questions. Yeah, so I'm actually gonna um, dangle the carrot a little bit because coming up on Thursday, February 18th at 10 a.m., there's a presentation that is called "Chasing the Fastest Growing Tree in the World: Albizia," presented by Frankie Coates and J.C. Watson. So. Um, I, there's a lot of interest in Albizia and I love it. So save the date. I'm going to put that in the chat and then you can access the webinar um, back on that deal in our website and stay tuned and um, learn all the things about Albizia. But listen, if you want to talk about killing Albizia, that's an... You, yeah, I mean, I would have to get back to you on that. I mean, I know there's a bunch of different techniques on basil bark. I would look up, let me find a link for you and give you that because that's not a misc target species. So I can provide some information that's put out by CTAR. Um, and that's a great resource for control information. Um, and so let me see if I, let me post the link in the chat for that. But definitely stay tuned for those those presentations coming up because that's going to be um, by people who are boots on the ground with Albizia and we'll have all of the answers for those questions because they're the ones. And targeting. JB posted the link. So perfect. Thank you, JB. <laughs> um, thanks, JB. Great. And uh, that's actually all the questions and comments that we have so far. Um, I wanted to ask before we, before we jump off too, if we could look at the poll one more time so I can copy it. Oh, I actually see one more question there. Oh, sorry. Yes, I think it just- We got one more, yeah. There you go. So um, Chris Candido is here. How is the battle going against Pittosporum undulatum? Oh, Chris, good to hear from you. So Chris Candido, um, he was the Pittosporum undulatum warrior back in the day. Um, so yeah, Pittosporum uh, is, I think, that see, Mike just found a new population. So there's a small population um, in the Kula area. Um, and I think that your survey work um, showed that it was a little bit beyond our capacity to control undulatum. But the other Pittosporum species, Viridiflorum, is under control. So new populations popping up here and there. But yes, good question. So that is another one of those high um, elevation species. Um, it's, you know, proved to be very invasive and I believe it was Jamaica. Um, so something, another resource that I didn't share with this group, but is always good um, is the Plant Pono um, website and resources. So that is a way to evaluate um, how safe it is to plant some of these um, ornamental non-native species. Um, and so you can evaluate the effic or excuse me, the, the safety of them for our environment by um, Evaluate or reviewing their potential to be invasive if they were introduced to Hawaii. So that's a great tool, plantpono.org. And just another Hi Sam plug there is going to be a webinar on the Plant Pono program on February 10th at 6 p.m. that this will be hosting, I believe. Um, and the title of that is Your Travel Guide Down the Road of Good Intentions. So um, yeah, Plant Pono, February 10th at 6 p.m. Again, back on that website um, that starts with DLNR to check more, check more out. There is another question. Um, so this question is asking what to do with captured frogs. Um, that is always a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, so it depends on the, the species. So um, there's two small tree frog-like critters um, in Hawaii. Um, the greenhouse frog makes sort of a chirpy, crickety type noise. So if that's the frog, then you have, they're in that not as high a threat and then widely distributed category so you can release it. If you're not sure what it is, take a photo and send it in. Um, you can also, uh, we have an online report form um, on our website that you can send photos in on, and we can help you identify it. On, 
And if it is a cookie, we definitely want to know about it. And you know, if you could keep it contained um, until we can confirm the identification and then we'll follow up with you. Um, but yes, if it's, there we go, thanks, Serena. Yep, if you go to that website, there's a good guideline that shows you, um, that helps you distinguish frogs. And then if anything, um, reporting it, is always a good thing and we can take a look at it. If you have photos of them, um, you know, take a photo of it in your reporting form um, to send over to us. Especially their little tool pads. <laughs> That's the easiest way I can, I've found. You gotta stay tuned for the cookie presentation this week if you wanna learn more. Got it. Well, mahalo for all of your questions, folks, and for, for tuning in. Mahalo for doing your part in helping protect Hawaii from invasive species.